A third characteristic of moments of spontaneous contemplative experience, which can help us to understand a way of life that would habituate contemplative experience day by day, is the characteristic of the paradoxical kind of knowledge such moments grant to us. Most immediately, what we become aware of in these moments is that in these moments, we cease to understand ourselves in terms which we are accustomed to understanding ourselves. That is, all our customary reference points to ourself. All our memories about ourself, our opinions about ourself, this and that, as Merton says, turns inside out. And there is an instantaneous moment where all considerations are rendered vacuous and we realize how utterly impoverished they are and capable of expressing what we're unexplainably realizing in this present moment. Thomas Merton once said about life in the monastery, he said, there is not a monk in this monastery that knows why he is here. And if he does imagine that he knows why he is here, then he really does not yet know why he is here. In the ultimate sense, none of us know why we're here. So often we're looking for the purpose of our life. But the extraordinary thing about being a person is that we're beyond purpose, that we arise from an infinite love for infinite love alone. There is no purpose that's big enough to account for us. Actually, it seems to me that when we stop and reflect upon it, this whole sense of being awakened to a depth of knowing that transcends thoughts and purpose and transcends things that we can grasp, really, the more we reflect on it, should not surprise us. For example, a seasoned artist is not perplexed in realizing that she does not yet know just what a work in progress will eventually become. For she learns to trust in what an artist friend of mine has referred to as a certain delightful lawlessness that flows out in the creative process. This is the basic distinction, I think, between art and crafts. Crafts are foreseeable in their outcome. That is, if you want a picture of a windmill, you can go get your kit at the store with the colored yarn strips and the numbered holes, and you follow the instructions on the box, and you'll get a windmill every time. But that very foreseeable quality to the craft is exactly what is transcended in the risking of art, in which the person is engaged in an act the ultimate nature of which she cannot grasp, nor understand, nor comprehend in conceptual terms. Merton once said in the monastery in a talk he was giving to the novices, he says, we all want to cross the Red Sea into the promised land of union with God. The difficulty is, however, that the Red Sea tends not to part until we're in water over our heads. We like to imagine that we can wade back and forth ankle deep until the water in sesame de mill fashion will part so we can cross over into the attained glory of contemplative realization. But it never works that way. It's only after you're way out over your head and maybe even way out so far that there's no way you could get back. As a matter of fact, You've gone out so far that you realize that there's nothing to go back to. What would you go back to now that you've come to know what you've come to know, and yet you do not know how to proceed? It is then that the water parts, not by delivering us from our dilemma, but rather by way of revealing to us how invincibly one we are with God in the midst of the dilemma. There's a Sufi saying that if your house is too small for elephants, you should think a long, long time before you marry an elephant trainer. 
you may have to make unplanned renovations. Merton once said, we should be very aware of what we're doing when we ask for help from the Holy Spirit, because what the Holy Spirit does is teach us to die. It's the only show in town. I'd like to give two images of this dying or this water over our heads or this coming to a knowledge uh, beyond what we can grasp because I think it's also paired up with this aching within our hearts. As a matter of fact, I think the aching within our hearts is what gives rise to this knowing beyond what thoughts can attain. The first image is that of a man that I worked with in a hospital setting one of my rotations for my doctoral work was doing psychological tests for people in the hospital. And there was a man there who had had a stroke, and I was informed by the staff that this man was a scripture scholar and a minister of a large congregation and so on. I went into the room, and he was sitting up in the bed, and we shook hands. I introduced myself. and. He said that he had been told that I was coming, he was expecting me, and I gave him the short little mental status exam. And I said, what year is this? And he looked at me in a blank look, and he said, oh, I know, I know, it wouldn't come to him. And I said, who's the president of the United States? He went, oh, that's, um, that's, uh, uh, and he looked at me, and his eyes filled with tears, and he said, See what's become of me. And besides that, he said, I just wet the bed. I want to give a very different image of this, but it's essentially the same thing. Sometimes between two people, it's like this. They say to each other, What's become of us? And what will become of us if it gets even bigger? What will become of us if it goes even deeper? In order to follow this path, there is within our hearts this willingness to die to all customary reference points in thought, all customary reference points in belief systems, all customary reference points of all that we can comprehend. And we have to be willing to look very deeply into ourselves and say to ourselves, see what's become of us, and what will become of me if it gets deeper, and if it gets bigger, and we already know that it's going to get deeper, and it's going to get bigger, because we already know there's no end to what we've gotten ourselves into. Dan Walsh taught philosophy at Columbia University. He was the first Catholic to teach philosophy at Columbia. And Dan Walsh was influential in Thomas Merton's conversion to the church, and he was also influential in Merton entering the monastery. Years later, Dan Walsh came and lived at the monastery guest house, and he taught philosophy at Bellarmine College and taught philosophy to the monks at Gethsemane in the seminary program. Dan Walsh said in one of his classes, I know it, I know it, I know that I know it. The trouble is, it's I who know that I know it. And when I try to tell you what it is that I know that I know, I can't say it. See? It's like it's crystal clear until you start to think about it. It's crystal clear until you try to put in words what it is that is so clear. It's a kind of obscure clarity. This is the knowledge that we become accustomed to, that the knowledge granted to us in moments of contemplative experience is a knowledge that silences us. It's a knowledge that awakens but in the Christian traditions is sometimes referred to as unknowing. It's a paradoxical knowledge that's arrived at precisely to the extent we die to our customary dependency on thought. 